I'm Zach Johnson. I'm Mitchell Hora. And this is the Fieldwork Podcast. We've got a couple guests here with us today. Jody's joining us uh, from the global headquarters. Tour. Global, global headquarters. Soil tour. Of the Fieldwork Podcast. And uh, Mike is joining us from Skype. Um, guys, thanks for joining in. We're going to talk a little bit today about tillage and choosing your tillage practices and whatnot in the different geographies that we represent. Instead of screwing it up, we'll just let you guys kind of inter- introduce yourselves. Jody, why don't we start with you? Um, give us a little bit about your background and and uh, share with us some of your wisdom here today. Zach tells me that you're famous, so sitting with a famous person. Famous. Zach, no, Soil Zach is famous. famous so. Soil famous? Yep, yeah. Jody's famous. Oh, wow. But That's pretty cool. Thanks for your doing soil, this. gosh darn famous. <laughs> <laughs> I came up with that just now. That did good. not have that prepared. <laughs> okay, so I'm Jody DeYoung Hughes. I work for the University of Minnesota Extension. Uh, my office is in Wilmer. I live out by Danvers, Minnesota, and I've been with Extension for 22 years. I spent a summer in Wilmer with Inez Consulting. Oh, I did know you? I know Wilmer well. I am in Fantastic. that uh, new. Um, Science, the state the technology. hospital. Yeah, yeah, the technology campus. <laughs> I've been told to quit calling it the it, state hospital. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. creepy. Yeah. <laughs> there are it there is. are tunnels. We'll get into underneath. that later. Yeah. Oh, I've been yeah. to the tunnels. Mike, uh, joining us from out north and west. Thanks for joining in here today. Tell us a little bit about uh, your farm. Yeah, I guess my name is Mike Langseth. I farm down in the southeast corner of North Dakota, and we are kind of on the edge of the valley. Uh, we raise corn and soybeans up here. Um, yeah, we've been messing around with less tillage and things the last few years, and I guess that's part of why I'm here talking to you guys today. Love it. Yeah, we're kind of just trying to, you know, open up some different ideas and whatnot and about that thought process, you know. So about that process of, you know, you've been reducing tillage for the last couple of years. Tell us about that journey. Tell us about... Um, how you started, where you're at now, and where you're heading. Okay, so when I sort of became an active manager in the farm about 10 years ago, uh, my dad had been no-tilling our beans for quite a while. Um, he had read some studies out of the out of NDSU and tried it out, and he came to the conclusion that the beans really didn't care if the ground was black or not. So we've been, we had been no-tilling beans, and then we had been uh, tilling up our bean ground before we planted corn. Uh, Full-width tillage, either disc it or field cultivate or something. Um, but when I got involved with the operation, I started looking at things a little bit. Okay, so why are we doing this exactly? Why are we doing that? I uh, took some soils classes up at NDSU and uh, wound up getting involved in this tillage project with uh, Jody and uh, Dr. Aaron Day. Um, the best day of your life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's actually worked out pretty darn well for me. Um, <laughs> and hey, don't, don't say that too loud, Mike. Jody can hear <laughs> Jody can hear what you're saying. <laughs> oh, she knows how much fun I had every time we actually had to go out and do the tillage for the plots. Stopping a farmer uh, in the to. fall to uh, put in four different types of tillage machines is um, oh wow yeah it slows them down. <laughs> so tell tell us about uh, tell us about that project there, Mike. How did um, it all go down? So we came up with the idea to uh, have a tillage study that would run at multiple sites on different soil types in different locations. Uh, around North Dakota and Minnesota to look at some of the more um, conservation-type tillage practices and some of the newer ones like vertical till against your traditional uh, chisel plow and field cultivate combination just to see um, how things stacked up, you know, up north and, and, and in the soils that a lot of people in this area are working with. So we set it up to have a uh, chisel plow and then two different types of strip till, one with a coulter and one with a shank, and then vertical till. Those were our treatments, and the treatments stayed in the same positions in the plot uh, throughout the study. 
and it gave us a chance to see just uh, how much influence tillage really was having on our, our yields and uh, other things, uh, soil health measurements and uh, all sorts of things like that. And I want to add that these were uh, full length of the field and where we could, we used uh, full field equipment, you know, like the, the full tr- size, full size. Thank you. So this is not a 700 foot strip. No. Done with equipment that would be completely different than what you're using, right? In a in a standard situation. Mm-hmm. So tillage tillage for me, um, being in West Central Minnesota where we've got heavy clay soils, mm-hmm. generally have colder, wetter springs, and yet we're still we're still in the area where we can grow good corn, and so that's what the market calls for. That's what the economics are in my area. So we try to grow good corn and soybeans on on our heavy clay soils. Yet we're far enough north that we tend to struggle trying to get no-till, some sort of no-till going. And I would say in my county, and maybe Jody, maybe you know better than I do even, but I would say we are at least 99% conventional tillage in my county. Yeah, I, yeah. there's pockets of places where people are no-till, strip-till. Um, it's usually, I would say it's not always because of the soils. I would say it's because of the people. Um, that if they had a lot of people that want to try it, I, it's more the mindset because like you're saying, it's cold up here and these plots that we have are actually further north than you and we're not finding much of a yield difference. On similar soils where you're trying yeah. to grow the same crop? So like Mike said, we had three different locations. We have his, which are the sandy loams. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe, how far is Ken from you? 12 miles south of you? Yeah, it, about he, that. He's on the Fargo clays, which okay. to me is the claim to fame for the highest clay content soils right. in the area. Right. And then over by Fergus Falls at uh, Charlie Pekarski's, we have, um, it's a clay loam. And so the clay loam, I think, is the most typical for western Minnesota that we see. And um, <clears throat> what we're finding at all three spots is they react similarly, but just but differently. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's confusing. Yeah. And you're testing all of these different types of tillage yes. on, on all three of these farms. Yes. They all had the same treatments. They're replicated, randomized as much as we can. And then um, f- for four years at Mike's location and the one in Fergus Falls, and for two years at Ken's. So tell us more about, okay, so what was the process there of being able to implement this? What were some of the things that you were looking at um, as we went about, you know, that maybe some of the farmers that are listening could try to, you know, emulate a little oh. bit of it at least, you know, and try to set up kind of some of our own trials too? Well, um, the main things that we do when we put them out there is um, the data that we collect, we go out there and do residue counts. And we also do uh, stand counts and stand height for um, corn. Yeah. Because a lot of times corn can have the same population, but if you see that it's a lighter green and shorter, that's going to come out to yield. Right. So we measure that, and then um, <clears throat> for the beans, it's just the residue counts and the population. And then we go back out and do weigh wagon counts because the yield monitor data sometimes doesn't uh, make it out of the combine, and then we lose data. So uh, <laughs> we always do the weigh wagon data, which, again, slows down our farmers, but they've but been willing. But if they can get really good data, then it's worth it right. to be able to kind of slow down a little bit and get mm-hmm. some information. Mike, what's been some of your takeaways as you've been involved in this project? What's some of the initial things that you've seen as a farmer? Well, um, after running all the equipment and actually being the person that gets out there and and does the tillage and plants the crop and goes and harvests it, and after looking at the data, uh, any of the systems work. You know, you can chisel plow in the fall field cultivate in the spring you can run a strip tiller you can uh do vertical till in the fall and then in the spring and they'll all work they'll all provide you with a pretty decent seed bed and uh the crop's going to come up and honestly it was hard to tease out yield differences so after looking at that for a couple of years kind of got in the back of my head okay all of this seems to work just fine so what's the, uh, what's the least impact and the cheapest option that I can go with? What's going to make me the most money, save me the most labor? And so that's been the direction that I've been following. 
and that I guess that's uh, that's led me to go to strip till for my corn and no till on the beans. So if we find that there's really not much of a yield difference, but you can keep more residue and you make less passes across the field, less wear and tear on your equipment, less you know less money being spent out in the field, why not go for that? Yeah, and I'm even so I'm down in southeast Iowa. And we're in the same situation where we're we're no till ahead of our beans and strip till ahead of the corn, mm-hmm. um, and using cover hops for for both. So interesting that you know we've kind of have the same conclusion that Mike has too down on our farm. So I got a, a question for Jody, and this kind of goes back to more of a, a personal thing on my own farm. You know, I would love to get into some no till stuff or some strip till stuff. Um, but what, what we've seen when we don't do tillage, or if we have a field that we didn't get the tillage done on for whatever reason, as we're going to, we're going to be able to see this spring cause we didn't get all of our tillage done. Um, but what we saw a year ago where we only had uh, 10 or 20 acres that we didn't get tillage done on was that field, um, was much, much wetter for much, much longer than the field right across the road. And, uh, we planted the field across the road on one day and that same day when I jumped across the road to look at planting that field that hadn't been tilled, it was sitting saturated. I mean, if you brush the residue away, it was wet, it was mucky and we couldn't even, it was too wet to, to till it and get it opened up and and try to get in there. Um, we actually ended up burning that 10 acres off to get the sun on it so that it could dry for a couple days before we could get in there to do any tillage. So, okay. And were you coming out of corn going to beans? It was corn residue, yes. Okay. So we do were you have plant a chopping on head on your combine? We do. Okay, yep. that will make a huge mat. Yep. And if you put a, a big mat like that, yes, it will stay wetter and cooler. Um, when you change to these uh, reduced till systems, you better have a better planter with trash or you know uh, residue managers well, on I have there. a John Deere planter. They don't get any better. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can there do that if we, right, we said no politics. Long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So it, if they have good uh, residue managers on there to clear off a strip, but when you're in no-till and strip-till, most of the corn stalk is upright, you know, a good 12, right. 18 inches. So that that it's mass not is not down. on the ground keeping the soil That's cold. That's a difference. Sure. Yes. Sure. So the ones that didn't get their tillage done this fall, if they had a chopping head, they will probably need to run a, a vertical till out there just to kind of chop things up and warm things up a little bit. Sure. Sure. Yeah, that's interesting. That's kind of what uh, what we've been seeing too on our farm. That we we kind of leave it up and then we kind of chop over it with the the cover crop. And what we've seen is with that cover crop, we're kind of pulling some of that moisture out. Maybe that that's something to it. Um, and obviously, we're significantly further south too. We're going to warm up a little bit more down in southeast Iowa. Um, so, but tillage. The reason why I still concentrate on that, and people are like, well, you know, it should be no till, no tillage out there at all, and it's. Like, yeah, that's not quite right. Uh, We have, like, what Mike has, those sands, and then what our other farmers have had is uh, heavy clays. We have all the way from Canada down to Iowa. We have extreme differences in Minnesota, and every state does. Mm -hmm. So, But to reduce your tillage, I think everybody can do. Reduce the, the number of passes, reduce how aggressive that machine is, or reduce the depth that it goes into the soil. We don't need to till to 8 to 10 inches. All right, so today talking about choosing a tillage system on the podcast. Join us in studio. We got Do- Jody DeYoung Hughes and Mike Langseth is joining us from Skype. So let's back up here just just a little bit and let's go over um, you know a little explanatory about the different kinds of tillage and whatnot. Um, so especially in the different things that Mike was experimenting with, uh, those different different types of tillage and whatnot. Maybe give us a quick explanatory on some of the different types that you see farmers using? Well, for the last 15 years, we've looked at disc ripping and moldboard plowing. And we did not bring that into this new research because what we've been finding is going deeper and being more aggressive in the soil is not helping yield. So there's a disc ripper, which has a disc up front and very large ripper shanks in the back. And they can turn over the soil up to 16 inches. They usually run them about 10 or 12, 10 and then there's moldboard plow, which is something that's been around since the beginning of agriculture, basically. John Deere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that it turns the soil totally over. So it's very aggressive, too. It buries all the residue. It buries the weeds. And it, it warms up the soil nice because that nice black soil now is in the sunshine. 
but it's the most erosive and the most energy consumption of the tillages out there. And then you get more to your um, medium depth ones, like the chisel plow, which goes about six to eight inches. And you can have that chisel plow, depending how you set the shanks on it or the points, be very narrow and not turn over a lot of soil or have a wide um, wing on it where it will turn over the soil. So it, it's adaptable. And, and then we have, and that's what we used at all three sites, a chisel plow. But it leaves the soil chunky, so in the spring you need to have a secondary pass with a field cultivator or with a vertical till. Then we looked at two different strip till systems where it cuts the residue, pushes it to the side, and then there's a shank that you can put down your fertilizer and then berming discs that capture that soil and keep it into a berm. It only tills about, uh, it depends how aggressive the machine is, but say 6 to 10 inches. And then it does it in strips, so strip till. And you plant right back into that warm strip in the spring. And then with the shallow ones, we're looking at um, vertical till and field cultivation usually. And vertical t and shallow discs. I'm not real fond of discs because they do a lot of uh, damage to the structure of the soil. It, you know, what do you see at the side? A little bit side? more smearing and that kind of yep, stuff. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. And what do you see at the side of the road when they're making a new road? A disc, mm -hmm. and it's because it, it pulverizes the soil, so it makes a really nice roadbed. But you don't want that in your field. So um, vertical till, the true ones just kind of go straight in the soil with either a wavy coulter or fluted coulter, and it just does a little tillage, and it only goes one to three inches deep. And a field cultivator uh, goes in the soil about three inches deep, and it turns the soil over. Mm -hmm. So um, vertical till is better at cutting. And a field cultivation is better at incorporating, like your fertilizers and, and weeds. Can you explain for some of the conventional tillage guys like myself that are listening a little bit more of how the vertical tillage works and what the idea is behind that for those that maybe don't have experience with vertical tillage? I mean, it's a word we hear a lot nowadays. It's mm -hmm. gotten popular. But there's still a lot of guys that have not worked with a vertical tillage machine at all, maybe don't understand exactly what we're trying to accomplish. And it depends if you're looking at true vertical till or something that I call more like a soil finisher that is actually discs. So if they have any concave or curve to them at all, then to me that's a disc. So with the, the coulters, um, it can either be on a gang, and you can adjust the gang to be more aggressive or less aggressive out there. And when we're using vertical till out at the, like Mike's farm and stuff, we try to be very non-aggressive. We're under five uh, degrees pitch on that gang. And then there's also another one that they're individually mounted, the coulters, and, um, and that you can't really make more aggressive. So it's, it's more of a slice and dice and chopping, and it throws the soil up, and it doesn't really turn things over. But it's really good at chopping up residue. And so it, is the idea behind that to chop up residue, or are we also trying to just open the surface of that <clears throat> soil a little bit without really damaging the structure below the surface? Right. Um, depending on how deep you set it. And uh, the, where I heard about vertical till and started getting all the questions was from northwest Minnesota when about, oh, I don't know, was it 10 years ago, when it was really wet in the fall and the spring and they couldn't get out there to plant or do any tillage. And the vertical till was about the only thing you could get out there. If your tractor can get through the water and the mud, this machine won't plug and will just go right over and, and do its job. It will chop things up. It will introduce air, and it will get a little soil on top of that residue. And it was the difference between not being able to plant and just running vertical till twice. Hmm. Mike, do you have experience with vertical tillage? I know um, you had it in the test on the site out at your farm where you've been testing it. What's your opinion on, on, on not just that test, but specifically vertical tillage, I guess? Uh, I don't have a machine myself. I've used it in the plot for four years now. Um, it doesn't, but it's very popular with a lot of my neighbors. A lot of my neighbors that are trying to move towards more conservation tillage have been using the vertical till. And it does a nice job of what it's supposed to do. It will size your residue, and it will break up that top two inches or so and kind of break the capillary action between that and the rest of the soil so that it will warm up and dry out faster. And it's it pulls pretty light, and people can go 10 miles an hour or more with it, and so they can cover a ton of ground, and, and they like it. I've got to ask how it stands up to rocks, for those of us that have rocks in our field. <laughs> well, it doesn't dig into the soil very well. It... Um... 
it, it kind of rides over them. It depends on your gang. But the problem is if the gang rides up over a rock, the whole gang rides up. You know, sure. you could have and five it misses six feet. right five or six feet not being tilled. And with the ones that are individually mounted, they found that the springs that were holding them could, if you're in really rocky ground all the time, um, could bust. <laughs> so okay. they've gone to a new thing. Rocks have a tendency to break things. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, that, that's interesting. So for our situation, we've got a vertical till kind of machine, a turbo till, and which would be a type of that vertical till. That was kind of a one of the steps in the direction, I think, for us in order to go away from, um, especially where we were corn on corn, we were ripping up till even you know, seven years ago. Then we went to just kind of that vertical till pass to be able to get some of that residue chopped up a little bit more in the fall and try to get it to decompose a little bit quicker for us. Mm-hmm. It was kind of a good stepping stone, I think, along the way. And uh, like Mike said, you can just cruise with that thing too, and you can cover a lot of ground, and it's a lot wider and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, maybe a little. It it takes some horses to pull it. You know, it takes some horsepower to be able to do it. But um, I think your fuel consumption, that kind of stuff, still ends up being better on a per acre basis, and cover a lot of ground really quickly for guys who are trying to cover a lot of acres and where labor is is a bit of, a bit of an issue. And a lot of guys that are uh, um, strip till with corn on corn. That is a lot of residue to deal with, and quite a few of them will use vertical till before they do their uh, strip till. Mm-hmm. But on corn and beans, they don't need to. They don't need to run that before. When you're going back and forth, yeah. Because yeah. you are not. You don't need to vertical till your soybean stubble because there's right. not really a whole lot there. That's where your strip till kind of situation, just like Mike has done, like we do on our farm, just strip till right into that soybean stubble, and there's not mm-hmm. a whole lot there anyway. And you don't, I don't know, for us, we don't really want to speed up the decomposition of that soybean stubble because it's going to decompose pretty quickly anyway, and there's not a whole lot there to try to protect our soils. And uh, I don't know. So, yeah, you wouldn't want to get too aggressive with it. Right. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I agree. I want to shift back to the actual study here that we've talked about a little bit, and I want to to hear uh, Mike's opinion from a farmer, coming from a farmer. What have you seen, Mike, as far as this study goes, and what have you seen as far as how it affects your fields and your crops, maybe your yields, you know, the economics of it? Just kind of give your general opinion on, on what you're seeing with the different types of tillage throughout that study. Well, the the thing that I was quite surprised to find uh, was that end of the day, yield-wise, there wasn't much difference at all. There was There was hardly any even one crop, one year, one site where you could find a statistical difference between the tillage on yield. And so, uh, to be honest, it just gave me permission in my own mind to see how, uh, see how much I could reduce it, see how much labor I could save and fuel and time. I like that word you use there on being able to kind of give yourself permission to do something different. Um, What I'm interested in is can we utilize your study right there to give more of us as farmers or as as folks listening to this podcast, give us the permission also uh, to be able to go out there and do that. And I know, Jody, I'm a big data guy, and you got some data over here that we want to (laughs) kind of share on this. And, And can we find some of this data or find some info about Mike's test or other ones online or can we see other info about it somewhere else well we just finished that study in the fall so the statistics and everything is still being run on it um for the four-year average and and getting all that down but we will get it online pretty soon um if you wanted to email me or um aaron day is also the other uh, scientist on this and we could send you the email of the packet that we gave to all the people that were um, helping us with this project, which is quite a few people. You know, we've, we got support from the corn and soybean growers from both Minnesota and North Dakota. We had uh, NDSU, U of M, lots of farmers, um, equipment manufacturers, just everybody. It was, it was, it takes a village to run these research plots. (laughs) What I hear all the time is, well, that's, that worked for you, but my farm's different. <laughs> they say that, you know, all the way from Texas to Canada. So, uh, you know, Texas say, well, it's cold up in northern Texas. And 
But I was um, there two weeks ago. It wasn't. That it cold. wasn't that cold in northern Texas. In, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if I go too far west, they're like, "Well, we're really dry here." Well, you know, strip till you can get the least aggressive ones that don't uh, lose a lot of moisture, and no till does work better out there for holding more of that moisture mm-hmm. in and building up that organic matter and whatnot to hold more moisture within right. the soil. Right. But for our higher clay content soils, what we're finding even, um, you know, we're, like I said, the sandy soils, the clay loam and the clays are are acting similar. They're not showing a big yield difference in anything. Um, Out of, let's see, uh, the four sites or the three sites over the four years, Mike, you had a little difference this last year in your beans. And we're just talking three bushel. Um, that the strip till both um, out yielded the chisel plow and the vertical till. But it's inconsistent. At Charlie's and Fergus Falls, they all yielded the same. Um, at Ken's in, uh, in the heavier clays, his yielded the same too. And uh, there was only one time that we saw a yield difference, and it was because it was vertical till and we didn't get to run the pass after the fertilizer was put on. So you got nitrogen laying out on the surface, which... Yeah, we had a yield hit. <laughs> so oh, put, yeah. your, if that put your nitrogen down. Able to really be used. That's right. a topic for a different podcast. Yes, oh, yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. So yes. in looking at this study with these three, these three studies here, these three fields, kind of in that western Minnesota, southern North Dakota area, it sounds to me like you're pretty convinced that this, this these are examples and these are real results that you can take just about anywhere. Yes. So the, these these systems can work in other areas. We're not just looking at western minnesota southern north dakota right and but the thing is you know when you say no-till it doesn't mean that you quit doing everything you know you have to have a really good planter that can cut through uh, a little more residue and you have to have a combine that throws that residue out in a even pattern out the back end because if you have those wind rose strips out there that's hard to get a planter through it's like anything else it still takes management Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and your weeds are going to shift Sure. You know, if you like dandelions, you'll get to see a lot more of those. Well, and uh, beautiful. Yeah, they're pollinator plants. So, hey. <laughs> All right. So, really great discussion here. Um, thanks, Jody DeYoung Hughes, for being with us in the studio, and Mike Langseth talking to us on Skype. We're going to keep the conversation rolling. Mike, tell us a little bit about that. You know, so as you're shifting tillage, I think one of the big, big pieces of that and big things that people have to think about logistics wise is you have a lot of capital, a lot of money in tillage equipment. And in order to rig up your planter and whatnot, put on all these bells and whistles and that fancy green paint that Zach has (laughs) on his, it takes some money, you know. So tell us a little bit about your process there that you went through, um, you know, in in shifting, especially when it came to equipment or some of the money on that that aspect. Okay. Uh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I guess we have... uh... It was definitely a lot of thinking through the steps before I made any decisions about which uh, equipment to buy, which equipment to change, which equipment to keep. There was a lot of sitting back and thinking and a little bit of experimenting, you know, pick a field here, try something, that kind of thing. So um, one thing to do was the last time we traded corn heads, we made sure that we got one that didn't chop. Because the more of the corn stock that is standing upright, the less of it you have to worry about fighting on the ground when you're trying to plant your soybeans. So that's that's one step. And then how do you get your fertilizer in the ground? Well, uh, some of the studies I've read showed that uh, actually out of the University of Minnesota that it didn't really matter if you got your P and K in the ground or on top of the ground. So that study gave me permission in my own mind to try that on some acres. And then um, the only thing we really spent new money on, because we'd had the no-till bean drill, single disc opener style for quite a while, was a nice set of floating row cleaners for the planter. Uh, Not even the fancy ones with the air pressure and all that kind of stuff, just the ones that would ride up and and change and float. So we didn't stick a whole ton of money into the switchover. Uh, Now, granted, we still had money tied up in large four-wheel drive tractors and tillage equipment that we were just 
letting sit. But, you know, we tried it out on one quarter the first year, and honestly, it was as good a corn as the rest of the farm. And so the next year we said, okay, let's try it. And we we went for it. We went completely no-till for 2017, and we decided after we mudded in the entire corn crop that that was probably a mistake. <laughs> Um, we did get the whole crop in and we did have great yields because 2017 was a good year um you know and we were above the county average but it was uh it was a struggle getting in because um like zach was saying that soil stayed wet right to the top all spring and it just wasn't getting any better that's a real difficulty, you know, for, for a lot of farmers. And I'm not sure what it's like where Mitchell farms, but I know in, in our area that is a real a real problem, trying to get that topsoil dry enough so that you can be out in that field. Work, mm-hmm. You know, whether you want to work that field or even just plant it, um, mm-hmm. it can be way too wet to just drive across it with anything. I, I think for me that's where I do like the cover crop, though. And, and I think that might be one of the things on even a small cover crop that's still growing a little bit, that the roots are in that top three inches, maybe that's something where you can pull a little bit more of that out, have a little bit more of that moisture up in the residue or transpiring out of the cover crop or whatnot. So then you're actually able to dry that soil out through evaporation and transpiration, which means that water going through a plant and out into the atmosphere. And when you're taking out that moisture out of the soil, then you have more air in the soil right. and the air warms up a lot faster sure. than water. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. I mean, that's and, why we do tillage, so it's kind of like a bio-till. Sure. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and also on, on the trafficability end of things, oh, yeah. we found, and, and a lot of my neighbors that have been trying different things over the last few years have been finding this too, that your trafficability gets a lot better after the first year or two, even. Just if you haven't ripped that soil or dug that soil six or eight inches deep for a year, year and a half, two years, it starts to get firm. And it, stay, it stays wet enough to have trouble keeping my row units clean on my planter. But I was out there, and it was firm. Um, and, and so that end of things does kind of fix itself. Not that the cover as crops don't help. As far as building the structure. Yeah, yeah, that exactly. structure built back up in those aggregates. One mm-hmm. of the farmers that I worked with uh, by Clark Field, um, he's a disc ripper, and so we tried different equipment with him and he really liked vertical till and I said why is that and he said because it gives me a two inch floor and because that's all he's you know he's taken out the structure only to two inches so he only sinks to two inches so next time you get ruts see if it's to the depth of your tillage well and when there's um erosion too yeah let's see how far down it goes and whatnot a lot of times Mm -hmm. we see that you know that the tilt that water erosion will go right down the furrow and whatnot and leave all your seeds right there uncovered. Well, why didn't it go any deeper? Well, that's that's the soil that was loose and susceptible to loss. So strip mm-hmm. till downhills. Yeah. Can yeah. So be maybe a, you got to be on path. the contour a little bit more. Yeah. You got to be more mindful of that. Right. And you're losing it too with chisel plow. You just don't see it in those those you know channels. Sure. Because the whole thing is the whole thing marked. is going instead. So how how do you look at you know, our listeners here today that are thinking about, you know, how do I evaluate my tillage system better? How do we go about that? How do we look at that system? A lot of times, you know, most of our listeners are going to be listening to this in the spring. Maybe they're in the planter. Maybe they're, you know, they've already done tillage for this year. As they're going through the 2019 growing season, what do we need to be looking for? How do I need to, what do I need to be thinking about as I go into even the fall of 2019? And thinking about tillage and whatnot after I take that crop out, what's what would your thought process be, you know, as we're watching our corn grow? Oh, I would just keep. Oh, yeah. go, oh, go ahead, Mike. Mike. Yeah, Mike, if you go got ahead. an answer, <laughs> I would just keep asking yourself the question every time you're doing anything on the farm. What is this doing for me? What am I getting out of this? This tillage pass. What am I accomplishing this time? And if, if your answer is, well, I'm not really sure, then you should think again about doing that pass. 
And it's so a it's, lot easier. That he's he's right. Yeah, that was a good <clears throat> simple. You know, just think about. I think we can do that for any pass that you're taking, whether it be I'm um, even like a herbicide pass or or fungicide or whatever it may be. Yeah. Thinking about is what I'm doing. Like why? <laughs> can I just stop for a second? And think about the reason why, and maybe we need to think about it different. I think one of the biggest hindrances is uh, tradition. You know, I mean, we had our dads and our grandpas mm -hmm. doing these things. We don't want to go against their experience and their, but, uh, you know, to, like Mike says, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I keep thinking of your dad, Mike. Um, <laughs> he, he, he wasn't as happy with me out there um, because we were, I was really slowing down the operation. So you have these uh, kids coming out of school that are like, hey, I want to try this. And and Mike has a dad that said, yeah, we can try it. It, it may be a little frustrating, but we're going to try it. Then I also, on the flip side, have older um, farmers that say, my kid's coming out just wanting to get this done and till everything up and um, you know just wants to go as fast as they can. So it's on both sides. Um, but I, I would encourage everybody to keep trying new things. I mean, you try new hybrids, you try new herbicides. Why not try different tillage? Uh, so I have a friend who does all conventional tillage, and uh, he's got a father who has tried no-till in the past and had very bad luck with it yeah. to the point where it is now not an option because it went that badly the several times that he tried it. So how would you suggest my friend would address that with his dad? I mean, you know, what? how do you talk to... Maybe, I don't want to say specifically the older generation, but somebody who's been through the challenges of that, mm -hmm. that had terrible luck with it, it didn't go well. They saw the economic impact of that, and 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 it stung them. So so, what has changed now? Hashtag from, asking for a friend. That's right. <laughs> hashtag asking for a friend. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> so how, how does yeah. that conversation go? I've been on farms where the dad says they'll... There won't be a strip tiller until hell freezes over, yeah. which I think it just did um, in <laughs> Minneapolis this it, last yes, week. So it did. Um, you can try it now. But it's, oh, yeah, it's it's a lot of different things. Um, it, it One, I would try on very small basis um, and go to a lot of different places to learn about this. Like Mike's dad, we had him come to the Conservation Tillage Conference and hear it from other farmers, not just university and, and NRCS and soil and water people, but hear it from farmers who are making it work in their area, mm -hmm. you know, and and to do that. And if your dad wants to come to the CTC for free this year, I will give him a sponsorship. My so. friend's dad. Oh, yeah. Your yeah, friend. friend's dad. <laughs> so, uh, Zach knows a guy. <laughs> yeah, I know oh, a yes, guy. You know, I will. I mean, I, I think it's that important that they come and see it from different viewpoints. Um, sure. It's kind of like a diet. I know I should be about 25 pounds lighter, and I know what I need to do to do that. Um, but do I do it? No. No. no, no. no. Tradition it's is I eat yeah. at night, okay? so yeah. <laughs> um, And it's, it's even more entrenched with farming. So in, in respecting uh, my dad's experience with mm -hmm. farming and the fact that he's been very successful as a farmer, and I really look up to him and, and what he's done on the farm, um, I've got to ask kind of from his point of view, what has changed in the last 20 or 30 years that would now, I mean, what do we know now that makes it okay to go with no-till or strip-till versus why it didn't work then? Okay. Well, with strip-till, we have a lot of different machinery now. It used to be a glorified anhydrous bar, mm -hmm. and now it's it's true. I mean, even the green guys have a piece of equipment out there, so it, it's legitimate. But the other thing is, is, the thing that has really changed in the last 20 years is, uh, or 10, uh, weed resistance, pest resistance, and disease resistance to all the chemicals that we're spraying. And it's not, don't get me wrong on that, it's we were built to do production. And we are doing a fantastic job. Yep. But we didn't know the other side of it. We didn't know the biology of the soil. And so a couple of farmers will come up to me and say, so you're saying I did it wrong. Oh, gosh, no. no. We had no idea. I mean, only 1% of the bacteria in the soil can be grown in a laboratory. We have no idea what that stuff does. Mm -hmm. And and it's phenomenal, and we're looking and we're searching, and I think it's kind of made farming fun again where we can not what is it and how do you kill it, but how can we build up our system to be more resilient. So we have that whole side of it that we never knew before or never really 
knew what it did, and we're still learning. And farmers are learning, or researchers are learning right alongside the farmers. I mean, it's it's kind of a cohabit, you know, co research on everything. It's um that, and our machinery is better. Our planters are better. Our combines are better. Our hybrids are better. Um, you know, we've just had more experience in it. So you think it really just boils down a lot to technology and and understanding what's going on with the soil and then again having that machinery availability. So mm-hmm. I want to shift the question a little bit more then to, okay, we've got the machinery available and we've got the technology, but in farming, as you know, as Mitchell knows, as I know, um, and as Mike knows, making changes is not cheap. So is there anything economically that we can do to to get into this sort of thing and and still ha- still have it be economically sustainable for us so that we're not taking a big hit you know because when it comes to farming if if you do the wrong thing one or two years in a row you really put yourself in, mm-hmm. it, you can put yourself in a really bad position in a hurry i would say that um one see if anybody around you is doing strip till and that they'll custom uh, mike has one near him that we used for the plots and uh, Charlie up by Fergus has a gentleman right near, near him that did that too. Otherwise, the um, reps for most of the equipment out there will come out. If you have some acres and maybe some neighbors that want to do it, they'll come out and showcase it for you. And uh, so did you hear that, guys? You have to go out and showcase for them now. And <laughs> um, the other thing is is that you don't have to start off with a $350,000 machine. Yeah, there sure. are machines out there that or But they're honest, so pretty. They are. Yeah. Yeah. They are. And if you have a big red tractor with four tracks on it, it's even prettier. They make, <laughs> they make red tracks. <laughs> I heard a rumor that they exist. Yes. I heard a rumor. Oh, no. So mm. there's um, that's a place. Or if your co-op has a strip tiller, um, you know, because jumping into it, yeah, that's that's an economic hardship, or it can be. Sure. Um. But if you know it, it's working for you and you try it on the fields that are the best drained and um, maybe a little lighter and start with your soybeans, start with the low-hanging fruit. Mm-hmm. Be strategic about it. Yep. And if it works there and then you get more confidence to keep. Because if you're doing full tillage and you go to no-till, you've lost all the structure and the soil just kind of falls in on itself. Yeah. And it takes a long time for that to to build back up. And you you can't farm for the future i mean you do you farm for the future and you farm for today right if you want to farm in the future yes you have to farm today (laughs) yeah yeah all right so really great discussion here um thanks jody deon hughes for being with us in the studio and mike langseth talking to us on skype you know and thinking about how we've invested in equipment whatnot on our farm it's been with the planters number one the planter for us, it's the best piece of equipment on the farm, and I think mm-hmm. that has to be. And um, and we're with Mike. We, Mike, we've got the fancy row cleaners though. We've got the Delta Force, and we got we got all the bells and whistles. And it that's definitely been a lifesaver for us in order to create more consistency. That the the soil is not super consistent because we've tilled it and make it kind of a garden out there. It's not like that. So, but with our planter that's adjusting on the fly thousands of times a second. Now we're able to create some of that consistency and give our crop the best chances at success that it can have. Um, Mike, interested in in how you guys went about it. I'm trying to think myself. You know that, like I said, I mean, I I remember coming back from football practice in early high school, not that long ago, and running the ripper, and for you know at night, running that ripper a lot, and in just the last couple of years, we've now gone away from it and it's still sitting out behind the shed it hasn't moved in years and the tires are all flat and whatnot but it's how still much do you want for that <laughs> for your it's, friend it's a, for my friend yeah. for a friend yeah for your friend and it's a nice piece of equipment we probably could have sold it i don't know why it's still it's still sitting there though just hanging out um and we've upgraded other equipment and whatnot but at this point i don't know why it's sitting there you know i at this point we're not going to go back to using it and that was just a couple of years ago. So that, that'll be an interesting conversation, though, to, to tie in some of that thought process with Dad. But, Mike, how's this gone for you? Has your family and whatnot been involved in this also? What, after, you, after your dad went to the meeting, because Jody drug him there, it sounds like, <laughs> uh, what was his thoughts coming away from that? Well, he was, he was fine with me trying it on some of the ground 
that I was farming semi-independently, you know, not his ground. (laughs) Right. No, (laughs) if if I wanted to try this out on a quarter, it was going to be my quarter and it was going to be my loss. If I I lost money on it (laughs) and I decided that I was all right with that. (laughs) And, uh, so yeah, the first quarter, first couple of years at it was just, just the one field, you know, and it was, it was a kind of an exercise in not spending money to try something out. And that was why we didn't have this partly because I was stubborn and I wanted to see if no-till straight no-till would work. Uh, that was part of why we didn't, we didn't invest money in a strip tiller right away. Um, we did spend, like I said, did spend the money on some row cleaners and, um, stuff like that but it was it was pretty bare bones just let's give this a shot on the first round and then um yeah after a couple of years of of not falling on my face doing that um we tried the the no-till thing on the whole farm and we decided that we needed to buy a strip tiller and we didn't spend two hundred thousand dollars on a strip tiller (laughs) we wound up getting uh what's supposed to be just a strip freshener. And so we run that in the spring and all it really does is move the residue out of the way until two inches deep, right where we want it. You know, basically if I could have run my roll cleaners uh, two days ahead of the planter, (laughs) I would have been happy. And I bought a machine that would do that. Yeah. And there's a lot of um, creative farmers out there that, you know, during the winter, instead of doing the honeydew list, they can work on their equipment instead, right? And we have farmers that use like a Lilliston cultivator and just run them in the 30-inch rows or you do the anhydrous tank or, you know, glorified anhydrous bar mm-hmm. and make it. And it, if there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Just being able to kind of change stuff up a little bit and experiment. And, and Mike, you said you're not on Twitter, but um, maybe there's some other resources and whatnot to get some different ideas Mm -hmm. yeah and then the one last thing on on the economic end of things it's expensive to change but you also have a lot of money tied up in high horsepower tractors and tillage equipment and the first three hundred and fifty thousand dollar five hundred horsepower tractor you don't buy saves you a ton of money well, yeah, I think it's your it's your buddy Gabe Brown up there. That I think everyone in North Dakota is neighbors, so I suppose he's your he's your neighbor. That his thing, right, is that it's uh, the pain when the pain of staying the same is more than the pain of changing or something like that. Then that's you know the opportunity to really switch, right? Yeah, and I I I, I have heard Gabe talk. Uh, we're not neighbors. He 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 farms. <laughs> oh, up at Bismarck. So I, um, it's even colder. <laughs> oh, only sometimes. <laughs> he, get... He's got a whole system running up there. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. He's like way, way ahead of, yeah, way ahead yeah. of the pack, but he's got some interesting things going on. Yeah. He's got an interesting story. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Zach, after, after hearing some of this, what, what, what do you think your friend's dad would say? Uh, you know, I hypothetically, would, I would say, if, if like if you talk to if your friend's dad hypothetically listened, right? What do you think he would say? I would say uh, most likely it's uh, it's been brought up before on their farm, hmm. um, and and it's it's really difficult to pretend this isn't me. So I'm trying to figure out how to word that. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we've had the conversations before. It must be this dude that's online, like the Minnesota Millennial Farmer or something like that, some right. pie-in-the-sky kind of guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, we've had the conversations before, and um, there's never been a, a straight no. Um, and, and again, I've never – I would never say, okay, well, well this spring we're going to go 100% no-till. We're not mm-hmm. touching anything. Yeah, you know, that's not – I'm, I'm, I'm smarter than that, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, but I would be really interested in trying a few acres – uh, and when, when we had that 10 acres a year ago where it hadn't been tilled and we were trying to get it tilled so that we could plant it in the spring, when I brought up not tilling that and just planting that, I believe the words were something along the lines of, if you want to try it, you better pick a field uh, farther from the house and farther from the highway and something I can't see yeah. on a piece of ground that you own, and then you can try it. And then 
we won't have to have the discussion anymore because he'll understand why I'm not interested in no-till. Mm. So, I mean, he, he gave me the opening to, to try it. Okay. And, and, you know, and I respect the fact that he's tried it before and has seen those results. But I think, I don't know, maybe I'm stubborn, but I'd like to maybe take the hit myself, see the results for myself, and, and work with somebody like Jody or the people that we've had conversations with on this on this podcast and try to figure out, even just on a small amount of acres, what I could do to try and make that work. And, and you have a strip tiller in your area. Uh, so we actually, we do, yes. Um, we have a neighbor very close that's got a small strip till machine, um, but I'm actually going to talk to you, Jody, after we're done here about um, the fact that we actually have a chisel plow that is, we've, we've turned it into a deep bander. So okay. we are using RTK GPS to strip our, our P and K in 30 inch bands. Mm-hmm. And the, the chisel plow, it's a, it's a 2410 John Deere standard chisel plow with an air cart behind it that bands every 30 inches. Well, we've got shanks on there that run every 15. Okay. So my idea for a potential take easy try would other. be to take out every other there shank that's not doing anything. And then essentially we have a strip till machine. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the issue is that it would not leave a very nice seed bed, but I think um, maybe that'd be a situation where we could try something with vertical tillage in the spring to level that off a little bit more because I think the, the chisel plow is too aggressive to, yeah. to leave a nice seed bed that we can just plant into without right. opening up in the spring. Right. Yeah. That's why there's, um, you know, the rolling baskets and, and all right. these other things on and there. We do have a harrow on it, um, so that helps a little that bit. That helps a little, yeah. But um, your soil will be a little bit cloddier in the beginning and so might need a little bit more freshening in the spring like with Mike's machine that he has it's just freshening in the berm and still leaving all the residue in between untouched but that sounds like a a good way to start and yeah we could talk about what you know I need pictures so I can visualize how how it's going to move through the soil and everything I've actually got a YouTube channel where I have documented Ah. some of that (laughs) okay you have a YouTube channel I I do yes we don't need to get into that now yeah but Jody and I are going to talk about that after this okay so, so Jody, while most of us are going to be listening to this podcast, we're probably going to be sitting in our tractors and letting them drive themselves as we're planting here. Um, what are some of the resources that you've got uh, where we can go and we can dig into this a little bit more? Um, you know, what what do you kind of want to leave our listeners with here now and, and some resources and some way to maybe contact you and whatnot going forward? Okay. Well, um, Aaron Day from NDSU and, and myself put together the Upper Midwest Tillage Guide. And that's the information, all the data from the last 15 years from North Dakota and Minnesota on tillage data. And it mimics a lot of what happened in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But people are like, well, we have much more uh, residue from the corn and things like that. So this is the newer set. And you can either just Google my name or go to the University of Minnesota Extension. And under soil health or soil management and health, you'll find it there. It's a little bit tricky just google upper midwest tillage guide you'll you'll find it and we have a whole website there too that you can start looking at cover crops if you want you know and maybe with your dad trying cover crops first or i'm sorry with your friend's friend's dad dad. yeah friend's dad yeah that you should uh, maybe try a little cover crops maybe he uh that fits more for you that would be a situation where we would have to we'd have to look at doing something different with the cover crops you know we we, Mm -hmm. we couldn't fly it on and try and get it established right. the way we've tried. So that'd be a conversation that you and I could have trying to figure out how we might go about it and trying it differently. Right. Because, I mean, this is a situation where I'm sick of wasting money on it because right. I haven't had anything work yet. Uh, oh, I know. Yeah. And you're going to, you can only try for so long. Right. If you're not going to have success at something. It, things are way too tight right now. Yeah. But that's part of just going and doing the research and whatnot and having that guide and, and having guys like Mike that are doing the research and whatnot for us. And like he brought up, giving us the permission to try. Yes. But and doing the research first. Yeah. Right. And if you want to talk to um, a lot of the educators and the farmers on that, then you can go to digthectc.com and December 17th, 18th in St. Cloud. So nearby you, um, we have that. And it's the keynote this year. We're going to try to find somebody that's going to talk about that. Look at failure more as a learning. What did you learn out of it? And then don't bet the whole Nothing farm. Nothing a failure, Zach. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we had our punching bag oh, established sorry. in the studio here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, 
but no, but that is a good idea though you know to to take a look at it and learn from others though too mm-hmm. and try to figure out you know as a community as a trying to establish that culture that was kind of brought up before and and whatnot i think that's really a big piece of it but you have to have somebody to kind of start that and be a catalyst for it right. and be able to build off of each other yes yes um like you said you know you worry about what the neighbors think um i married a a a guy who went out of farming before he met me. It wasn't my fault. And he, we would go by a farm place and he'd say, why do they need four gravity wagons? I don't, why, you know, you take inventory when you go by each other's places. Look how big that tractor is. Why do they need that? And, you know, just it's, so you could be your own worst enemy sometimes. So like your dad's saying, put it on the back 40 where nobody sees it. I, you know, respect that and let's move on with it. And pretty soon people, they'll say, wow, those fields look a little trashy out there and you come driving up in a new pickup so well and and even if nothing else i mean that would be a learning opportunity Mm -hmm. if nothing else yes that's good stuff mike uh what about you a couple last takeaways here for our listeners and and how can we keep in touch with you uh well that's a good question (laughs) keeping in touch with me um smoke signals from my (laughs) smoke signals yeah no uh on that end my wife is actually our county extension agent, and I believe her handle on Twitter is at Richland County Extension. And so to get a hold of me, that might be one of the better ways. Otherwise, um, and she's a smart cookie. She knows yeah, her agriculture. Yeah, she does have a master's degree in soils from SU, NDSU, and, and she's, yeah, pretty smart. So... But yeah, final thoughts. I would just say um, for your friend, uh, my dad had tried no-till back in the 80s too when it seemed like a good idea, and it hadn't gone well for him. And so he was resistant, and that was a lot of why he basically gave me the same thing that your friend's dad (laughs) told him was, yeah, sure, you can try that on your field. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so anyway, there, there's that. And um, one thing that is fairly satisfying is looking at the ditches next to your own fields and not seeing them black. We haven't that talked much on the That drive con- me crazy, <laughs> seeing the black ditches. Oh, yeah. I saw a lot of it. Snurk. Yeah, yeah, yeah we snurk. did a yeah. – we went out and analyzed that ditch snow, too. Yeah, we didn't even get to some of that info and whatnot. Right. You've done some – some research on that and have some data. Yeah, yeah. It's about, um, we went to white ditches and black ditches and took them all the way across. And the soil that was moving to the ditch that the ditch collected, I want to make that clear that it wasn't per acre on the field that was leaving. It was what was accumulating in the ditch acre. was anywhere from um, 2.7 tons of soil to 33 tons of soil were gathering in the ditch. And the average of those six were nine tons. So 18,000 pounds of your best soil was Ended leaving. in the ditch. Mm-hmm. That is crazy. I and think it, that's a key thing is that that is your best soil. Mm-hmm. Not even just saying the amount, but understanding that that is the soil that has the, the most capability to hang on to nutrients. That's the yep. soil that you want in that field more than any of the rest of it. The other thing, uh, my uh, guy who... Uh, private consultant that works with me over the summertime he also did a soybean cyst nematode count on that soil and guess what they're moving with that soil <laughs> oh sure <laughs> they uh, up to 8500 count in in that some of that ditch soil and that's not even counting what's leaving by air so if you have a gray sky out there it's going hundreds to thousands of miles away or to the next strip till guy who has residue standing he's actually collecting your soil for he's you he's collecting yeah that there you amazing go. soil there you go uh-huh I like it. Well, a lot of really, really good stuff. One more thing I'll tell you is if you want to try something and you don't want the neighbors to talk about you, I have signs that say research by University of Minnesota that you can put out there and you can blame us. Blame it on some Yeah, else. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> I think this has been another really good episode. And Jody, thanks for the you know, leadership that you have with it. And Mike, for you as well on being able to try new things and giving us permission, like you said, to to also go and try and experiment. Right. So thanks to our guest today, Mike Langseth, joining us on Skype, and Jody DeYoung-Hughes joining us here in the studio. Great conversation to be had. Right. And if you did want to get a hold of me on Twitter, it's D-E-J-O-N-0-0-3. 
And then my email is dejon003 at umn.edu. 003. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> I've, I've got a tagline. You want me to out this? Okay. Let's do it. All right. All right. So thank you to Mike Langseth, farmer from North Dakota, and Jody DeYoung Hughes from the University of Minnesota. This has been another fun con- conversation on the Fieldwork Podcast. So thanks for listening, everybody. Until next time, don't soil yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Over and out. <laughs> thanks, guys. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>